I'm really glad you come welcome that man in. Great pleasure to welcome you. It's really good to see you again. Same here. Glad to be back. I'm really sorry that email didn't get through. We've got to run that thing down and find well, out what's going on. There's a little bit of... Anyway, welcome. Welcome very much in the audience to Conversations. Pleasure. Great, distinct pleasure on my part to welcome to the program Lawrence or Larry um, Grossman. Uh, he'll be known to many, I'm sure. He was for a long while the president of NBC News. He was also the president of the uh, public, um, uh, what do you call it, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service. He had written a book some 10 years ago, I believe now, that we had done a program with him at the time called The Electronic uh, Republic. The what was the title, subtitle? I forget now. I had it Reshaping wrong. Democracy for the Information Age. It was a book that kept me up reading it, underlining virtually every page. It was a very prescient uh, presenta- uh, consideration of the electronic uh, communications capability that was evolving. And he's now co-founder, uh, co-chair of a very promising and very important development along with Newton Minow. Uh, a co-chairing called the Digital Promise Project, which we're going to want to talk about in great detail. But first and foremost, welcome very much to Larry Grossman. Th- welcome very much to Conversations, and thanks for such a very well-led life that continues. Well, thanks a lot. It's good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Maybe every 15 years we can do this well, program. Well, 10, I think. Is I mean, it 10? Make it a de- yeah. We could make it a, de- a decade, a decade, decade celebration. Probably. Okay. Uh, share with us your background a little bit, okay? Please, and we'll wait, and then we'll get talking about some of the issues. Particularly, we want to talk about this Digital Promise Project. It is, has a great deal of promise. But could you share your own background, please? Well, I thought you did quite a good job. I spent most of my career in television, mm-hmm. although I started at Look Magazine. Remember Look Magazine? I do in remember. The Saturday Evening Post? When the, in the era yeah. of the great magazines. Mm-hmm. Then went to CBS. I ended up in charge of advertising at NBC News. Mm -hmm. Started my own company in 1966, and uh, to serve media companies. And a new PBS was just arising, Uh and Sesame Street and PBS were some of my clients. Okay. And I ended up becoming head of PBS in its earliest days in 1976. Must have been a challenging time of great growth. Yes. Uh And. we were the first to put in the satellite system really for distribution and broadcasting yeah first yes we did before home before box office anybody else had it yeah. we built it okay. <clears throat> i thought it was a terrible idea when our chief engineer said it was something we should do but i had an idea that public television should get back into the public affairs business it had been politicized during the nixon era uh-huh and uh, and got agreement from the senate when President Carter came in to mm-hmm. open the hearings for the new cabinet okay. uh, in uh-huh. the Senate committees. Uh-huh. So that for the first time, the American people could see their new leaders right. and who they were and what their background was and see the Senate questioning them. And uh, came back, and the idea of televising live hearings right. was terrible to many stations because they had contracts with school boards to run reruns of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and... Uh, electric company and so on. Right. And yeah. so I uh, ran back to the uh, head of engineering and I said, Did, couldn't we transmit two different programs at the same time if we have a satellite system? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, let's go ahead and put it into effect. Right on the spot. Huh? Right on the spot. Good for you. Johnny well, on the spot. Yeah. And then... Uh, you, so you ran two programs. So two. we ran the live hearings during the day and uh-huh. we were able to run the repeats of Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers so that the educational television stations did not violate their contracts with their school boards. Now that's good thinking. And so the big city stations could could Uh do it. Uh Uh-huh. And we started the McNeil Lara News Hour. Really? In those days and Frontline, some of the great documentary programs. Great Still moving along. Right, yeah. And and Grant Tinker, who then was the great head of NBC, called Mm -hmm. me and asked me to come run NBC News in 1984. 84? You, you after were at eight PBS year, after earlier. eight years at PBS. Eight years at PBS. So it's been a very strange career. And, uh, very. Went to, uh, to run NBC News, even though I had not been in the news business before. But you were interested in public affairs. I always had done public affairs. Yeah. And, uh, and was there for four years when GE bought NBC RCA. Right. 
And Jack Welch, who was then the chairman of GE, who was a very dynamic leader, mm -hmm. and a very effective leader, but was not particularly in, enamored of the news department, which was spending a lot of money. We had some uh, strong disagreements, and he won and I lost, and I left NBC News. I see, yeah. It's <coughs> hard to do because it's all working on demographics and uh, what do people want to see, and news can be seen is a lost leader, uh, a, a well, loser. Well, used to be seen as a lost leader. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> and it was very important to the mm. broadcasters as to who led in news, which yeah. network. Uh -huh. But after a while, that, that sort of wore off, and money, bottom line, was the be-all and end-all of television, as mm. it is, was with the rest of the industry. We were chatting. Uh, we haven't gotten into it. You, you were born in New York, and that, we get moved. Born in Brooklyn. Born in Bro a Brooklyn bred fellow. Okay, That's very right. good. And he sco went to school or educated? Went to school, school in, or at Columbia in University. Journalism or no, in public in public affairs, political affairs, okay. English literature. Okay, it's a great good. opportunity. Yeah, right. Okay, that's that's so. just sort of a, a thing. But we were chatting before we began the camera going that you had a communication with Mr. Brian Lamb, who I had had a communication with from a different perspective, as he was thinking of starting the C-SPAN. Maybe you could share that, or because I think it might be important in terms of the fact that they have a programming service now that the cable industry, which was right. emerging. Uh, is very, very proud of in a jewel in the crown kind of way. But well, the cable industry was absolutely right. It was a brilliant move by the cable industry to underwrite C-SPAN. Mm -hmm. Brian Lamb came up with this wonderful idea that the American people should see their legislators at work, the mm -hmm. House of Representatives and then the Senate. Mm -hmm. And he got permission from the House of Representatives to televise their proceedings, mm -hmm. although under great restrictions in the early days. <coughs> the, the House Speaker insisted on controlling the cameras, and there were rules about not showing empty seats and not showing congressmen reading the newspaper while the debate was going on. <laughs> right. And and Brian, who is a, a brilliant thinker and a very advanced yeah, statesman, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, tele, the cable industry underwrote the idea of C-SPAN because they th thought correctly that the putting the congressmen on television would make them well disposed to cable. Uh, and, right, that makes sense. Yeah, and, uh, good and, business move. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Until that time, the broadcasters held sway in Congress. That's right. And cable was put under all kinds of restrictions so that they wouldn't compete with broadcasting. That's right. Remember, c cable was the new guy on the it block. Was the new guy on the block. Yeah. And Brian Lang came to me. I was just starting to run PBS mm -hmm. and saying, "He's got this idea to televise the, and got permission to televise the House of Representatives." We were building broadcasting's first satellite system. Yeah. I didn't realize for that. public television uh -huh. to dis be a dis uh, distributor, and uh, he said, "Can we join forces and dis maybe you can distribute C-SPAN to the cable uh, to the cable companies around the country while you're distributing your broadcast programming to the public television stations?" Right. Okay. You sort of like you had done before. And I said, "That sounds like a great idea." Uh -huh. Until I began to think, as the president of PBS. Uh -huh that the House of Representatives, the Congress, really had say, final say over how C-SPAN would conduct its affairs in those days. Yeah, and they had a hard time getting it into the Senate, I remember. And it was tough getting into the Senate. Yeah, and they said, you know, we got a lot of big egos over there worrying about their image and things. Right. They're not very familiar with the electronic. Well, it's like the Supreme yeah. Court today, which still yeah. does not allow cameras right. into the court. Right, right. And, uh, or the whole court system. Cameras in the court. Might in the be. federal it's court. A, well, yeah, but it, I'm sorry, it's another sidebar. Yeah. But I, yeah. Uh, so I went back to Brian Lamb and I said, you know, public television is having a tough time getting out from under the image of being a government run operation, right. government controlled operation. Mm -hmm. We were suffering from the old Nixon politis politicalization of public television. Uh -huh. So I think it would be a mistake for us to join forces because it would seem as if not only would the House of Representatives control the cameras for C-SPAN, mm -hmm. but then maybe they think they'd have a say over how we ran our programming on right. PBS. Right, 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 right. Uh, and Brian Lamb went on to greater glory with yes, C-SPAN, yeah. now with three channels, and mm -hmm. plus radio, plus mm -hmm. online stuff. And those channels can and be expanded now that we're coming to a digital age. I certainly age, hope yeah. so. 
and doing great work. I mean, we watch C-SPAN all the time. I couldn't live in a universe without yeah. that. I had conveyed to you. I was going to ask you that. The Telstar came. When was the year that the Telstar came where you could have a satellite connected uh, uh, connection to cable so that you didn't have to bicycle tapes to the head ends across the country? When did that probably appear? Because I remember doing, a, if I may, I remember doing a program, I mentioned it to you, with Gerard, uh, Gerald Levin. Right. He was the head of home box office. They were happy as kids with a toy that they didn't have to send these great big two-inch high beam, uh, you know, they're like 35-millimeter film rolls to each head end. They could just link it all together, and that was a big development. I'm trying to think when that well, would have been. It was in the 70s, I think. It was because, early 70s. I because uh, in 76, we started working on the broadcast satellite system for broadcast television. You said you were the first. And we were the first. Using right. using a, a transponder. Using transponders. The transponder in the sky, a, yeah. The big problem we had was they had to build a big satellite receive station. Yeah, 20 and, meters or and something. And there were huge yes. uh, dishes. Mm -hmm. And the college campuses, because many of the public television stations are licensed to colleges and universities. Right, right. Did not want that eyesore on their campus <laughs> until they <coughs> said, Consider it to be a sculpture for the 21st century, <laughs> yes. or a futurist to show that you were ahead of the curve. Bring in Henry Moore to do everything good And then they all, yeah. then they all liked the idea. Yeah. and we succeeded in putting it all together. A lot of fun. Right. A lot of uh, you a lot know, of fun, a lot of agony. Uh, and Brian Lamb was wonderful. I shared with you the idea. I told him I, I'd done that thing with Mr. Levin, and I said to him, "Why don't you do a thing where we could present the intellectual leadership?" Because I'm coming out of academia on a channel where we use Telstar uh -huh. and the cable, and he just brought out an envelope and said, "We're going to try to do the House of Representatives," and now that and and he put it on an envelope C-SPAN and he pulled it off in spades and uh, underscore again because we're now in cable television. This is a public access cable right. television venue here that we're doing here now, so we're in the cable industry in a sense, uh, sort of, uh, but uh, that is now. As far as that industry is concerned, it's in a lot of uh, confrontation with history in that there's all these digital things going on. We want to get to that with your digital promise and everything like that. But uh, they're in, uh, in, in t the, the relationship with the public access. But they are all, all that industry is, uh, thinks of, of C-SPAN, which they support better than PBS. You were right, I think, in that. But it gave them also b bragging rights, or they think of it as the jewel and the crown in terms of public service, apart from all the shopping channels well, and other things that they do have. But that's a really important sense of public service that they provide to the American that's, economy. That's I think the they may be able to start taking that attitude. Some of the visionary leaders of that industry might be able to take that attitude toward public access. Well, we have three thousand so. of across the country, rather than treating it as gr the people, as grudging thing, right. take it as a uh, an item of pride, if only in public relations terms. I just want to get a plug in for the people who might be viewing who are in that realm, because public access is a very important part of a democratizing movement in terms of communications. Of so I got to plug in for public access. You did indeed. Yeah. You've been on the frontier in that, and now, of course, through the internet mm -hmm. and iPods and all sorts of cell phone communication, yeah. uh, people and YouTube and so on and hard so on. Hard to keep up, isn't it? It's hard to keep up, but mm -hmm. there's much more access. And yeah. People can put their own stuff on television. And if I may say so, if there was any book around, it is still highly recommended. The book you wrote, uh, The Electronic Republic, is a, a really major source that everyone ought to repair to now in order to get a sense of what's going on. A lot of water's gone under the bridge from the beginning, and uh, we were at a transition point 10 years ago when we did that program. Your book was prescient. And maybe we could talk to that a little bit, and then we want to get oh, right. To, we want to get right through to this very important uh, initiative. You and Mr. Minow, uh, and a lot of other board of advisors of high repute and so forth, have recommended. But maybe the book. Let's get to the book. And you were taking a wide systems view of communications at that time. Well, this was written just as the internet was. I was beginning to hear about it and learn about it, and it occurred to me that. We were having profound changes, living, starting a new era of profound changes in our political system.
You were right on that money. Where, uh, where public opinion was being registered behind every decision that was being made. Mm -hmm. And as the public had a greater opportunity through television, those then beginning through the Internet, mm -hmm. to comment on what was going on and to be aware of what was going on, maybe too much of an opportunity, many people think, today, mm -hmm. because uh, of the intensity of sudden information flowing and often wrong information. Getting information overload in many cases. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was changing the nature of our democracy, which had been, you know, we were started under the Constitution as a republic, mm -hmm. where there would be representatives who would make the key decisions after they were voted in. Mm -hmm. Because in the old days, nobody ever saw his or her representative or the leadership right. and to accept at election time. Right. And now, on a daily basis, you could test the wind and find out what the temperature of the public is. Right. And it became much more of a the mo mo moving in the direction of direct democracy right. and reducing some of the checks and balances that had appeared before. Right. And the electronic republic tried to, based on Plato's old republic. Yes, you went right back to Periclean Greece. To, yeah. to mm -hmm. Greece, which mm -hmm. was the first uh, direct democracy we had. Yeah, although it was based very largely on a slave society. They had well, slaves. it was based on a slave society. It was mm -hmm. limited to uh, male citizens mm -hmm. and so on. But uh, and then it, and it, but it lasted quite a while, and well, then it, it, uh, it broke up in corruption and uh, and uh, went down the drain. Yeah, but and there's a lot we could still learn from the lessons that the Greeks learned back thousands of years yeah, ago. Yeah, there's templates, they said, and right. uh, yeah, it's moving. And James Joyce had that. Let's say history is a nightmare, from which I'm attempting to awaken, and that's the hope of the promise of the time. We may be awaking at the end of the long period of the extension of consciousness that technology is that alters the environment in what would hopefully be a liberating uh, uh, well, direction. Yeah. You know, every time there's a new medium that arises, everybody, when, whether it was radio or movies mm -hmm. or then television, everybody thinks it's a great opportunity for education. Yeah. And a great opportunity to improve ourselves. Yes. What it's been is a great opportunity to divert ourselves <laughs> yes. and to entertain ourselves uh -huh. and to, in many ways, in many cases, avoid dealing with the serious problems of our time. Neil Postman wrote a book, Entertaining Ourselves to Death or something? Yeah. Or well, I yeah. think he overstated the case. Well, he may be, yeah. Uh. But, uh, but we have the same thing going on now. Mm -hmm. uh, back ten, exactly ten years ago, this is now going to the Digital Promise yeah. Project. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Uh, there were some of us who thought that these new information technologies, which were beginning to revolutionize so many aspects of our society, how we communicate, how we, our finances, just the idea of having ATM machines in, uh, in banks so that you could draw out money or deposit money overnight. Staggering. Uh, how we produce things. Mm -hmm. It was changing how we fight wars. Uh, these new interactive telecommunications devices and, inf and information technologies were revolutionizing every aspect of our society. Absolutely. But was leaving behind education, the museums, the libraries, with the repositories of the great holdings of our civilization. And we said, nobody is focusing on public policy, how we use these new technologies in the public right. interest. Okay. And yeah. a group of foundations got together, major foundations in the country, mm -hmm. and they asked Newt Minow, the former chairman of the FCC, Federal who Communications Commission. Who famously wrote about a famous, great wasteland. Famously gave a speech calling television a great wasteland. <laughs> yes. Uh, and they asked me originally, mm -hmm. uh, coming out of NBC News and having, having gone to teach at the Kennedy School mm -hmm. uh, and PBS, mm -hmm. if we would chair, co-chair, an inquiry mm -hmm. to come up with some recommendations for how to use these new technologies to have them serve the public interest. When did that come into being as a kernel of an idea that was going to be developed? 1999. 99. Right. Very Ten pressing. Years, a, very Ten, a decade ago. Just right at the moment of it the It was at a time when Congress had passed the law requiring all of television down the road to convert to digital which communications. Which is about to happen, yeah. Which is about to happen. Mm -hmm. And public television was trying to figure out what its future would be. Sure. And I was serving on the board of a public television station, Connecticut Public Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And 
the foundations, and we were inquiring and coming up with ideas about ed using it for education and for lifelong learning and for workshop, job training, and so on, because it would be interactive. So you could, yeah. as the Defense Department was beginning to do with the Army, you could mm -hmm. train soldiers and you didn't have to bring them into a classroom. You could train them wherever they were right, and they could ask learning, questions. Yeah. And so Newt and I began this uh, effort on a pro bono basis, Good. went around the country, and came up with a series of recommendations, the chief one of which was that we needed to really transform education for the 21st century, mm -hmm. education and workforce training and lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. There was an opportunity to use these technologies to really radically change how we taught, and how we learned. And you, you had, you drew upon a good widespread group of advisors we and had, so we forth, commissioned which you've also got papers. now behind you in an advisory sense and uh, in That's order right. to deal with things in Washington and so forth. Well, and we published a book called The Digital Gift to the Nation, saying okay. if we use these, we could digitize collections in the libraries, right. in the museums, mm -hmm. we could spread throughout the world the yeah, best aspects absolutely. of our society and our culture. Were you drawing upon the intellectual community and the cyber-wise people and the people exactly. that were understanding the implications of this newly emerging cyber? And what came out of all of that, uh -huh. <coughs> we came to fruition just a year ago, uh, less than a year ago, last summer. Congratulations. Yeah. When uh, the Congress passed a law mm -hmm. as part of the college uh, Higher Education Act mm -hmm. to start up the first new national research center in many years, comparable to the National Science Foundation. Wow, okay. Well, isn't the National Science Foundation still there? The and National Science the Foundation will, and the Guy National Ford Institutes Stever. of Health will yeah. are doing research. Yeah, national Institutes of Health is another major health, research right. center. And so this is has a, a very unwieldy title. It's called the National Center for Research in advanced digital and information technology. Wow. But it will serve the school systems, the universities, the community colleges, do research for, to transform education. It will serve the museums and the libraries, all the public interest forces in this country, to bring them into the 21st century and the digital era. Huge challenge. And yeah. so the, the, the new Research Center for Education has been passed by the Congress, Wonderful. signed by the President, and we are now awaiting its appropriation. first appropriation. Okay. And when that starts up, it will be in the form of a nonprofit, independent, uh, nonprofit corporation mm -hmm. that will take private donations as well as public appropriations from the Congress. Okay. Yeah. The first board will be appointed by the Secretary of Education. And we've Who just, is our Secretary of Education? The new Secretary of Education is Mr. Dunlop from uh, Chicago. I want to get in touch with him. And, uh, well, he knows Which about this. Which new program? Oh, uh, well. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's great promise ahead. Indeed. For, for the first time, we spend almost a trillion dollars a year, this country, in education and training. In how all how do we measure that? How is that measured, and who, who supplies the, the data on that, or where does the data come from? Well, it from? comes from the Department of Education. From the department, yeah. And, and we spend practically no money on research, so we're still teaching and learning the same way we did centuries ago. Where do we, do, where do we go for that? We go to, uh, you can go to MIT Media Lab, we could go to our scholars, we could go... Well, I noticed that, if I'm not mistaken, you could, you've got a board of advisors that's very impressive, Including Mr. Schmidt, yes, who is at, uh, you know at at, at, Google, at Google, which right. isn't a small matter. No, but and they've signed on to it's and the others. There's a lot of other. It's very prestigious board of advisors that you right, have as part of the leadership group. Who, yeah, both from the private sector who recognize the need for a highly qualified, highly competitive workforce in the uh, United States. Uh -huh. So we've got to do something about our education system. The president mm -hmm. has has given a speech in which he focused on the need to reform public education. This is President Obama. President Obama. Did Mr. Bush take a lead in that, or what was his position? Or is no. there a big change now that we've had a change of administration? I think there's a very big change. Okay. And now, now President Bush 
did the No Child Left Behind, but yeah. underfinanced didn't it. Didn't fund it. Didn't fund it. It doesn't do any good unless you can get the appropriation, really. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we are looking for an appropriation, and it's, it's really modeled under the National Science Foundation, which has done the great research to Absolutely. expand our science capacity. And it's time that we had the same capacity for education, for job training, for workforce training, for lifelong learning. Uh -huh for this new knowledge century that is developing. Absolutely. I can remember this. Now, you used to have a man, Guy Ford Stever, was the head of the uh, National Science Fund. did great work, and it did a lot. We used to have also, didn't we have, you would be familiar, it was a thing way back when uh, the Office of Telecommunications Policy yeah, well, within the exists. system. Is that it's still a, there? It's is still it still there. functioning? Is it relevant to what you're doing in terms of gaining information? And do we go to academia for understanding? Do we understand clearly enough the implications of the changing consciousness that the technology is hard? Well, I'll give where you it, it's a philosophical and uh, also politically realistically based major transformation that seems to be taking place. And, do we have the intellectual moorings, and who do we go to intellectually for understanding the broad implications of the transformation that this whole planet's going through now? Well, there are many research universities that are doing, yes, capable of doing work, but Standard, I'll give you a surprising yeah. answer to okay, that please. question. Okay, please. I would like, yeah. Which is the most promising area that's being explored mm -hmm. is maybe in many ways the worst area, which is the video game. Yeah, industry. they go like crazy. I mean, there's a huge <clears throat> amount of attention. The kids today are totally capable of doing, using all of this in electronic interaction. And they do. It's a magic. huge industry, right. isn't it? But it's all done for entertainment and diversion. Right. We have done, with the Federation of American Scientists, some uh -huh. prototypes to demonstrate to Congress <coughs> and to the education world what can be done for learning. And I'll give you... Please. One or two examples. Please. There's a new game out that the Federation of American Scientists has developed called Immune Attack. Immune Attack. Immune Attack. Mm -hmm. Immune Attack is based on video game theory. Mm -hmm. And what it does is you become embedded with an agent that's attacking the human body. A virus okay. or a bacterium, right, okay. right, huh? an infectious disease, right, right. and I become embedded with the white corpuscles that are organizing to fire, to, 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 combat, to, to combat it. Yeah, huh? and sometimes yeah. you'll win and sometimes I'll win. Yeah, but in the course of getting involved in this game, you see how the blood flows, how the white corpuscles uh -huh. organize to love fight it. off I the disease, it, yeah. uh -huh. how the cells divide, how the heart beats and sends the blood around. <laughs> Wonderful. And, I love it. And as somebody who was not a very good student in science, uh -huh. if I had that when I was studying biology, you to learn like crazy. I might even have been interested in going into into Medicine. science. Yeah, right. There's That's another, wonderful. We can, they keep the dialectic of a wartime kind of thing, where you got a dialectic of well, a good a guy, bad guy, of, right. as a thing that is intrinsic to so much of the conflict in the world and so forth. But then they do it in a way where they can get learn, biological education in the process, exactly and they're, right. they're very adept at that. And they, they, can, they know how to do that. Right. They play but those it, games. I, I have no, do, you have any, so do you have any personal playing of those games? I'm not even, I know it's huge. It's a huge I've never business. played a video game. Well, we've played, and we played a th this particular game. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh Immune attack. Yeah, immune, immune attack. attack. I'll look for it. Yeah. Look for it at the Federation of American Science. And we're you can see it on our, see some samples of it on our website, digitalpromise.org. Okay, digitalpromise.org. Okay. And another website which you can get the game is linked, is the Federation of American Scientists website, fas.org. Okay. FAS.org. And they deal with these video games and as they part deal, of the overall There's procedure. another prototype that we developed uh, with their help mm -hmm. called Discovering Babylon. Babylon hmm. is where Iraq is now. Yes. It was an ancient city in yeah. Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. and it's where numbers and the alphabet were born. And uh -huh. you go on an archaeological, this is designed for grade school kids. The alphabet? Yes. The phonetic alphabet? N letters and numbers. 
and well, you go okay. on a tour of ancient yeah. cities mm -hmm. in an archaeological dig, mm -hmm. and you find an ancient city, and you see how the cuneiforms of letters yeah, started. Yeah, the cuneiform seems different than the phonetic alphabet. I don't mean to make a fine point. I mean, this is what would yeah. happen with scholars. They would say, well, wait a minute. Marshall McLuhan used to say Western civilization was based upon the phonetic alphabet, created linear thinking. I have a whole for instruction. And cuneiform was different. See, but this is what argumentation would happen when people start going. But right. I, I didn't mean to interrupt but, you. But, but what it does is it opens kids' eyes yeah. as they follow this archaeologist down to into the study in an, of an in ancient. And it's got a sense of adventure. <coughs> ancient city. Yes. Uh -huh. And you find how they let people lived and what they did. Geography. Historical. And it's you know it's just sort of magical. So is in, that in terms of edu say, edu educational capacity? So education can be fun. Well, education cause, could always be fun yeah. if you had a wonderful teacher. Yeah. And if you read the right kinds of books. Okay. But now in this era, of if you when played kids, the right kind of games, maybe. when the kids are electronically literate, beyond and, belief, and we have a very inexpensive distribution systems through the internet. Yes, absolutely. And through discs. And, and the prices are eroding all the time. And the prices are... So we can spread this stuff throughout not only the nation, yeah. but through the world. But more than that, you yeah. can take advanced courses, mm -hmm. which in the remote rural communities or the inner city, mm -hmm. the schools cannot afford to, keep, to have teachers who specialize in these. Mm -hmm. And you can put them on interactive television mm -hmm. or interactive internet mm -hmm. distribution. Mm -hmm. For, they're very expensive to develop, but once you develop them, you can distribute them so that they can be used in the most remote places or in the poorest slums. That's the same metaphor for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you get the development, the research, you get the pharmaceutical, new drug development and that, and then you can make a generic knockoff for just nothing, practically, once you make it. It's a metaphor for the larger use of technology and the growth of knowledge. And, for, and probably will have uh, implications in terms of economic policy, because everything is becoming interconnected and so forth. That's certainly the case. I wonder if I could get another thing. We had a great uh, polymath that I happened to be greatly influenced by. Uh, it was uh, Buckminster Fuller. Right. He was great a man. comprehensivist, maybe the best mind in the history of humanity, putting things together in a pattern way. And to size it up with Mr. Um, who is the great cyberneticist? I can't think of it now. Uh, Norbert Wiener. Right. Norbert Wiener was in a room in 1946 or so with about 12 people. I have a friend whose father was one of those 12 when they coined the term cyber. But Norbert Wiener said information overload permits pattern recognition. That you can see patterns. You may be information overload. We got information overload. And it permits pattern recognition, so you can move toward a more comprehensive understanding of systems thinking in a way that we've that we've not been able to do historically. It's all specialized out rather than getting at larger patterns in which the events taking place within a systems way can be seen. He had, but Fuller put together a thing called World Game, and they had all of the non-ideologically larded trends of population, new materials, technology, ephemeralization, the ten the, put it all in the game in trying to make how do we make the planet work. And he had findings from that. So that could become, it's, I, I would just suggest, that could become one of those video games that we're working in with good information, and that information can be verified and so forth so, so that they could be you understand? So, so the game idea in children or people learning through a game process is a very promising one. Well, it? that's one one yeah. of many opportunities yeah. and, and promising things ahead. Mm -hmm. well, part of the function of this new National Research Center is yes. to serve education. Where will it be located? It will be in Washington, in D.C., Washington. and okay. it will serve as the National Science Foundation has and the yeah. NIH, National Institute. Be affiliated with them. Yeah. It will serve to commission research uh -huh. to develop new technologies that will aid education at all levels oh, okay. as well as workforce training. You know, DARPA, yeah. the military yes, they developed research the internet, group, yeah. which developed the internet, yeah. uh, has really done marvelous work yeah. in training the armed forces yeah. how to repair tanks, how to use new weapons, how to use new equipment. 
without bringing everybody into a classroom and reaching people, there's troops no matter where they're located, yeah. uh, where they're stationed throughout the world in the mm -hmm. most remote corners, mm -hmm. and bringing them up to date and conducting interactive back and forth yeah. discussions. They have war games traditionally. Many of those technologies much. would yeah. do wonders for our education system. Right, 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 and, right. And similarly, imagine having accessible the m best stuff from the great museums of the nation. Thank you. What a that, dream. That yeah. can come to any community, no matter how far removed from those museums. Right. And similarly, the great books in the libraries. Yeah. Now, Amazon is, is uh, mm -hmm. in effect, Google is, in effect, seeking to put, digitize every existing book yeah, and make it world. available throughout the world. They're also working with Sergey Brin. He's got a new place in New York now, Sergey Brin. He's down in Greenwich Village. They just bought a new place. But he had uh, such a, his attention was put toward trying to translate the, what, 5,000 languages of the world to a thing where you could speak in English and have it come out in the languages of the world? Well, magic is being done. Isn't that place. something? That, that, that they really put a lot of attention to that. So you could have a chip and you right. could speak. And I wonder, the implications of that are staggering. Well, we've only just begun yeah. in this whole electronic right. telecommunications generation right. and, to, and uh, to see what the potential is. Now, the, uh, much the of the research has been led throughout the what, two, uh, whatever long history of uh, mankind, a couple hundred thousand years we've been on the planet, and much of the research has been led by politically organized people who organize what would be called military advantage getting to them so that they can go and defeat the tribe in the other village and steal the grain and grow and have their system grow. War making and uh, that kind of thing has been the leading edge of the technological research supported by the Medici's or whoever the you know the, the Makas of the time are and so we've been led by that and now those war making systems are so destructive, uh, have we done any research, or can we do any research, how destructive, or transparency, make it available to people, make people know what the, uh, what the, the situation is, the actual existential situation of humanity. Um, are the weapon system species lethal now? Do we have research on that, the weapon systems that have been leading the technological extension of consciousness from a political perspective? outdated institutions, nation state outdated, things are out, so much is outdated, the moorings to history are outdated by a new transformative kind of reality. Do we have thinking going along those terms? Are we coming to a period of punctuated equilibrium in the evolution of universal consciousness? Are we coming to the end of the human experience? Those kind of things. It's signaling such qualitative transformation. Are there people thinking along those lines? and uh, able to incorporate the historically inherited institutions, amortize them, deal with them, whether it's a, a uh, nightmare that James Joyce called history. We had such injustice, we had such poverty, we've had such, you know, systems out of history, but is it a, it, it's got a liberating potential that is equally existentially significant to the destructive. And how do we put all of this together? Where is it going to be put together? Well, in terms of getting the, the blueprint for yeah. where and what's going on in this universe. You're asking cosmic questions yes. as somebody who is not equipped to answer cosmic questions, but I think we have an opportunity mm -hmm. in a very practical sense okay. to take advantage, and we have a great history, by the way, of that, for all of the evil and all of the destruction mm -hmm. that these technologies have produced. They've also produced unparalleled democratic wealth. They've also produced the Internet, They've also produced great medications. Penicillin was developed during the war. I World wouldn't war want to II. live in a world without anesthetic. Would you have your uh, leg cut uh, off well, when you're anesthetic. fighting on a bullet? Right. No, thank so, you. So, out of, and, and of course, in recent years, mm. out of television and, and these things that occupy so much of our time, yeah. to distract us, to entertain us, to divert us, how do we use them to improve our knowledge, to, to, to expand our horizons, mm -hmm. to become aware of the culture and our civilization that we have, and, and uh, to educate ourselves. And how do, our, how do our inherited institutions, 
How do we liaison with inherited institutions that were formulated and rooted in a historical development? We will repair to the Constitution of the United States and this kind of thing. And we got all these institutions that are being qualitatively transformed. It's a problem with technology. You have an old technology that has to be amortized. Or you've got patterns coming out of history that we want to be moorings to what we're doing, but we want to be able to subsume that within a new order, and that's been done dialectically by cutting off the heads of the leaders who were leading that outdated process historically. Where is the vision thing going to be coming from if, if it's calling for that? If that that's what well, I'm vision, saying. I mean, it's, it's all subject to the limitations of the human inte intellect and emotions. Yeah. But it's my way of thinking is mm. to take very small steps that become very big leaps. You know, one great step for mankind. Here we have an opportunity to set up a new research center oh, that yeah, can transform yeah. education, mm -hmm. that can transform training, job training, so mm -hmm. that people who change their jobs now with increasing frequency uh -huh. have to learn new things. <coughs> that can trans, as we have an older growing population yeah. in the knowledge age, mm -hmm. that could keep them lively and informed and educate and, and being educated mm -hmm. all through their lives as opposed to stopping education at grade school and then at high school and then at even at college or mm -hmm. graduate school level. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to keep continuing education and <coughs> taking advantage of our great existing institutions, Absolutely. our universities, yeah. our libraries, our mm -hmm. museums, mm -hmm. our schools, yeah. to broaden their reach. And it's Be not concerned enough. with the goods of civilization. The best Art, that poetry, can, philosophy, the thinking, humanities, rather the arts. than having to have everything bow down to Moloch, well, in down to the pr practical necessities of how are you going to have bread to eat. And to, if we put that out on the internet, uh, the scale of the whole human society, it doesn't serve well the system that we've inherited. Uh, two thirds of the world population. But look, and look at how it. are we going to be able to lay us on with this future? It, it, and what is the qualitative transformation that is as equally significant to the destructiveness of the weapons? Is it possible we're getting to where the iron clawed laws, laws of scarcity are no longer a problem? We may be actually coming to a thing where we're transcending in terms of design capability the iron clad laws of scarcity. We may be transcending scarcity as an ontologic reality for the whole system, including the creatures. Well, it's, it's like punctuated equilibrium in evolution, you know, a qualitative change, not just a quantitative. It's and where do we go to get some sort of a moorings like that from our, I where are our visionaries? Where is our, our, our Voltaire? Where are the visionaries that we could repair to to help give some lodestar Polaris direction to the overall operation of the system, whether political or I'm not, not sure Voltaire is the right one Maybe to fall back <laughs> on. Maybe, this, okay. this is the best of all possible worlds. Yeah, right? okay, yeah. But you understand, what, but do we know what we're doing? Well, well, we've got this economic thing that's happened. It, it could go into a gigantic depression. It could happen very well on the could. faces of it. If we cling to the old ways and don't have vision, where's the vision? Where are our visionary leaders well, that we can Let's look to? at the history, which you've been so negative about, however. <clears throat> One of the most interesting and least known facts about the United States yeah. is that once in each generation, in each century, once in each century in this country, mm -hmm. we have taken great strides forward in the fundamental area of education. It started just as the country began when the Constitution was voted upon with the Northwest Ordinance, yes, which actually came true. before the Constitution. Right, right. That said every state should set aside a certain amount of public land so that people can, the money from that public land can be used to educate it's then boys. Right. But public education was founded in the United States. That's true. Horace Mann came along then. Well, this was way before Horace Mann. Okay, this yeah, I understand. Yeah, right, the, right, 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 you are. Yeah. In the 19th century, yeah. mm -hmm. in the middle of the Civil War, mm -hmm. in the most desperate time this country ever had, That's right. Congress passed and Abraham Lincoln signed the Land Grant Colleges Act. That's right. And, and the, the Homestead first, Acts, too. Well, the Homestead Acts were earlier. 
But the, for the first the time, teachers. the land the land grant colleges act made higher education available to workers and farmers. That's right. And taught it had a tremendous impact economically on this society. Yes. Uh -huh. And in the 20th century, in the middle of World War II, right. Congress passed the GI Bill. Yeah, magnificent. Yeah. Bringing a college education, making it available to millions of veterans, mm -hmm. and again having a tremendous effect. Remember, there was all that worry, how are we going to afford to pay to send all these people to college? Yeah. But look what it did for our economy and for the leadership yeah. of yeah. the country. Yeah. And now true. in the 21st century, yes. for the knowledge age, and the digital age, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to make the same leap forward by starting this new center okay. that will transform education <coughs> using, taking advantage of these digital information technologies, the advanced information and digital technologies that have already revolutionized so many aspects of yeah. our society yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. still have got to make their mark in improving education, right. in improving job training, in improving lifelong learning, and making it much more available and accessible to people in the most remote rural communities or the inner city You're talking slums. about remote rural communities of, of our country or of the world? Of is, the there, world. is there a world standard? We can export not just the, the, the most popular arms. and work, uh, arms and, and American television. That's what we do a lot of, don't we? But we can export the best aspects of our democracy. Wouldn't that be a good idea? It would be a terrific idea. It would be idea. a terrific idea, and I'm all for it. I think it's a grand idea, and I think there's great hope in that these kids. I went to a party the other day. They had a seven-year-old kid. He was playing the computer like Vladimir Horowitz plays the, uh, the, the piano. Well, we've all had and experience with our grandchildren. It's very encouraging. Much more advanced than all of this. Yeah, they're learning it teachers. like by osmosis, which is very encouraging, don't you think? I mean, that, they, didn't, they weren't taught. They weren't, it wasn't like you had to set up a program. They just do it, and they all know how to do it. I think that's well, very encouraging, that's because, don't you? Because they're c communicating with each other. And it's become a very important aspect of every kid's life. Yeah, and country. they all know that the zorch connects to the zilch, and how do you do it, and how you save so it. So we have got to put it, make available not just auto chases and shoot 'em ups. Yeah, but that's good to uh, you, that, that thing you told me. What would you call that? Immunology or that game? Immunitech. Immunitech. That's great because you got all this education about the human body, but you're doing right. it in a game where you're even maintaining the dialectic and everything if you have to and everything. But at least it gets them going, and they would play it, and they would be learning. So the possibility. Learning can be fun. A lot of learning has been thrown uh, because it's a way, learning can be a way in which what you're mostly doing is teaching them to bow down to authority. Authority figures so they'll fit into an authoritarian, organized society and do what they're told, like good soldiers, right? Understand? Yeah. There's a lot of so what you want is to keep the creativity of those five and seven year olds active and going and, and investigating and so forth. It seems to me that'd be a and liberating getting, getting out from under the rote method of teaching and yeah. memory into letting kids figure things out for themselves and, yeah. and also letting yes. teachers and parents evaluate and understand how well the individual kid is doing, not just on a whole class basis or on a whole school basis, yeah. but you can adjust programs to serve the needs of individual kids where their strengths and weaknesses can, their strengths can be reinforced and their weaknesses can be observed and might, then dealt with. Might well be, but this kid, he was seven years old and he's playing that damn thing like Vladimir Horowitz plays the piano. Wasn't even thinking, but just doing it. So it may be in the good book, or one of the scriptures, one of the wisdom schools said the children shall lead us. It may be they're going to be taking exams on us and that we're going to be the ones that are going to have to measure up to the understanding that they're born into and have just a assumed it as as uh, osmosis. I think, you're osmosis. I think you're we're going to be led by the children, maybe, which might not be a bad idea. They might have some new ideas, and we're going to have to sub have the old systems fit in to the new systems that are emerging as a metaphor, maybe. It well, might the, be also encouraging. The most, <clears throat> probably the most conservative, hardbound system that we have in this country have got to do with education. Yeah. And the opportunity to open things up, not and by the way, we tend to have too much trust in technology to win our wars and conduct our lives. But if we can figure out how to use some of this technology in the public interest for the public good yeah. to improve ourselves, 
then we'll be, I think, accomplishing a good deal yeah. that's worthwhile. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, going off. I have great faith in the kids. My favorite people, I think, are five-year-olds. They're just so gorgeous and creative, and they got curiosity, and they're honest and uh, everything. And we, uh, then we go, and it goes down after they go to school. They're learning how to do what they're told, so they'll fit into a corporate cor corporate bureaucracy where they'll do what they're told. Right. Anyway, I don't want to go off on right. one thing: the practicalities of this. Now, y if I may, with your uh, d digital promise uh, project, could you go into that a little bit more? And now that we have a, a new president, and I, you said uh, it's been passed and so forth, can you give it a little more detail and let the people know about that because it's a major development. It'd be wonderful to have such an institution uh, in Washington. Yeah. Well, as I say, it's the closest, <clears throat> it's modeled on the National Science Foundation yes. to do for education, for training, workforce training, skills training, mm -hmm. and for lifelong learning, for the arts mm -hmm. as well as Good. the sciences. Yeah. Uh, what the National Science Foundation has done for science, what the National Institutes of Health have done for health, mm -hmm. and what DARPA, the military research operation, uh, for the Defense Department has done for the way we fight wars. Mm -hmm. We have not had funding for research in education and teaching and learning comparable to what potato chip manufacturers, I'm talking literally, spend yeah, yeah. in research, research yeah. and doing new forms of potato chips. Or the color of the box is going to sell more or than if it's a different uh, color, or all that kind of right. marketing thing. Yeah, it's been, we, it's been our obsession. So here we have an opportunity. The seed has begun. Yes. The Congress has passed the authorization. Marvelous. You got that through, and you have people who are familiar with public policy issues and how to deal with the right. Congress and that, yeah. And now we, and we can't start it until it gets its first appropriation. Yes. And we hope that in the next budget round, mm -hmm. FY. 2010, which starts on the federal level in October of, of this, this year. Of this year, 2009. 2010. Oh, two th 2010 starts in October 1st. The fiscal year for the federal government starts in October. Octo so it'll be October of this year, 2009? This year, 2009. For the budget, 2010. For the 2010. So it's there that the decision could so be. So it's there that we, we are hoping to get the first appropriation. It was authorized, voted in by an overwhelming majority of Congress on that's a bipartisan a good sign. basis. That's Bipartisan. That's good. That's uh, something has bipartisan. has sponsors on, from both parties. Because how can you oppose the idea of doing research right. for the most important aspect of the future of this country, namely uh -huh. our education system? Uh, absolutely. And it's been neglected in, in terms of and the... And the uh, uh, again, I don't want to. The Office of Telecommunications Policy that was there, who was it? A Whitehead or I, well, I forget. It, well, it no, many got, years ago. Um, it was Harold. No, but it's a, it's part of the Department of Commerce, and it's really not focused. It was on then, education. It was the Department it, it of Commerce. It still is. It still is. It's still yeah. there. Okay, I got. Well, I can't remember who was the head of that, but I remember there was that. But uh, so that um, so that is there. And uh, we haven't had that, and uh, it's a great, it's a grand idea. And I, I just can only say what we should do everything we can to help set a political context where that can be given adequate consideration. Now we have the stimulus bill and so forth that's going. We have this uh, huge amount of uh, questions about economic organization of the society. Uh, it would seem to me this that you're proposing would be along with a lot of other ideas that are being proposed. Uh, would be part of a very large package. The fact that the country and the world is in this economic condition, does that hinder or does that add, given the new presidency and so forth, and the moment that it, it heralds, is that, is that context one that is, uh, from your assumption, having been involved, one that is a favorable context for the realization of your uh, promised dream and well, uh, your think, promised project. I think know. it is favorable. You okay, mentioned, good, the, good, you good, mentioned good. the stimulus package, yes. mm -hmm. uh, the recovery package, as yes. it's now called. Mm -hmm. There, yes, are, thank there you. are tens of millions of dollars in that package for hardware for schools, okay. for, for computers and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's no money in that package for research. And what right. we need uh -huh. is to use that equipment uh -huh. in the most effective way, yeah. taking full advantage of the new opportunities, the new digital 
technology for educational purposes. For educational purposes. Well, that's part of the vision thing. And that's what yeah. we are looking for right. to start up this National Research Center for Education yeah. at all levels. Right. With uh, with an appropriation. Right. To to, to get it going. Up. Mm -hmm. that can then become a major force for good in our and society. And what would it be called again, the institution? It's, the institution under the legislation has got this catchy title. If you give it again, you know, so we'll the, be learning about this. The yeah. National Center for Research in Advanced Digital and Information Technology. Really hitting the money right on the mark in terms of the questions that are, are, are likely not exactly only to pose right. the, the conundrums we're facing, but also the Solutions to leading to a much better, uh, a be much better situation. I only could wish you the very best, uh, capstone to a long and distinguished career for which I thank you enormously, and we well, all do you. because you've been a real lodestar for many, and I appreciate that very much. And it's very interesting, and I just wish you all the very best. We'll put up the uh, the uh, website, and Good. again, let's say it out loud here now. It's digitalpromise.org. Digital. Digital promise.org. Right. It's a very rich site where they lay out the people who are involved. You've got a board of advisors. We've already had bipartisan. That's important now and yes, within indeed. the political context to have something that is. We're re reaching for those kind of things. We've got a young prince of a president and so So it may be that it's going to be part of a, a leading edge of transformation that's going to be liberating in the best sense of the word, not only this country, but the world and I thank you enormously for all that work and for putting that together and particularly I'd like to thank you for coming in on this 10th year anniversary of our doing these conversations. I look forward to the one 10 years Ten hand. years from now. All okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank really you for good. the nice words. Thank you very much. Your pleasure to have uh, the perception, we might have to talk a little bit more, but uh, the perceptions in of uh, Lawrence or Larry as he's known affectionately by many uh, Grossman, who was, of course, the uh, president of the uh, NBC News and the PBS, and is now uh, involved with uh, Mr. Minow and uh, Murrell. And, Amar and, and Murphy. Murrell. And Murphy. And you have people who understand public policy. He's a co-chairperson who is the former president of the uh, American Arts Alliance. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And he's a who's in Washington and is doing a brilliant job on our behalf. And you have a wonderful board of advisors, and they've put it together in a way w with the system in place, thinking it through, pr pra not only with visionary idealism and visionary perception, but also with the practical means by which it can be actually realized right. in reality. And that's very important work that you're doing. It's been Thank endorsed you. by uh, every major national education Organization okay. by the CEOs of our high-tech companies, who, including Mr. Schmidt, including Mr. Schmidt, who recognize the need for a highly qualified, well-educated workforce mm -hmm. and are concerned about or that citizenry. for the future. And the, and, and the and the Council of Mayors, yeah, who recognize the need to do something strong to reform our education system. Right, right. Well, the educational system to the citizens. Uh, Yes, a, a major challenge. I mean, that's a major and, challenge. And a very confronted. good new Secretary of Education, I think. Okay, uh, his Dun name is again? Duncan. Duncan. Uh, is, uh, I think that's his Scottish? name. Scottish? I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, we'd like Chicago. to be in touch with him and wish him all the best.